the Nikabi Diary Season 1 ebook with clickable links for each episode is available now, complete with 52 illustrations and inspirational quotes from each podcast guest. Click on the link in the description to get yours. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Season 2 of the Nakabi Diaries podcast, a platform dedicated to sharing the stories of the women behind the veil. This season, we will be speaking to more Muslim women from all walks of life as we continue to discuss their deep and intimate reasons for wearing the niqab. The Niqabi Diaries, our experiences, our perspectives, our voices. I'm your host, Samar, and thank you for listening. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister, how are you? Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, sister. Alhamdulillah, I'm doing good. How about you? Alhamdulillah, very well. Jazakallah khair for joining us today on the Naqabi Diary, sister. Could you please introduce yourself for the listeners and tell us a little bit about what you do? Okay, sister. Well, this is Hajira. I'm an engineer, a graphic designer, IELTS trainer, life coach, and I was working as a lecturer here in Saudi Arabia. I'm also currently doing Hibt and I teach Tajweed online. Mashallah, Tabarakallah. What kind of engineer do, engineering do you do? Computer science. Sister. Okay. Cool, mashallah. Okay, well, inshallah, later on we'll talk more about these different things, inshallah. 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 Okay, sister. So could you um, give um, the listeners a background of your, you know, maybe Islamic upbringing? How you got to start to wear the niqab? Uh, Alhamdulillah, sister, that was never a problem for me because I live in Saudi Arabia. I have been living here since I was born. So uh, it was never a problem for me to wear niqab or even start niqab because as I attained puberty, Mm -hmm. uh, I automatically started wearing niqab because my mother is wearing it. Also, both my parental, sorry, paternal and maternal sides have been wearing niqab since a very long time. So I come from a very uh, religious family. Mm-hmm. So it was never a problem, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So have you had any, any experience traveling to other countries while wearing the niqab? Uh, I did travel to India several times. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, sometimes in airport, they give you weird looks. But that's okay. Once we are done with the uh, all the checking and everything, everything gets fine. But not a severe problem or anything of that kind. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, mashallah. So, um, would you say that the niqab was a barrier of any kind? No, alhamdulillah, never of that sort. In fact, whenever I used to travel in several places here, here, alhamdulillah, in Saudi Arabia, that's never an issue because of the culture. But even in India, I used to travel in several places, but that was never a barrier uh, because um, I think most of the people in India, they have this uh, tradition of wearing niqab. Maybe their parents, uh, their moms are wearing it, mm. or maybe their culture itself in the Muslim communities, it's pretty easy. But okay. yes, in some communities, it is becoming harder nowadays. But usually before, when I used to travel, it was Alhamdulillah good. Alhamdulillah, mashallah. So have you, have you met any sisters then um, who they would like to wear it, for example? Because you mentioned that sometimes now can be difficult in some communities. Have you met any sisters who they really want to wear the niqab, but their families are against it or anything? Yes, yes. Uh, not personally, but online. Several sisters do message about their situations. And mm. uh, it really feels sad to see that they are in such situations where they cannot practice. But I always tell them that since Allah has put that in your heart, then Allah has chosen you. So Mm -hmm. it's better to go with the feeling that Allah has given you, right? Because if he has told you, because not for everyone, Allah put that, uh, put that thing in heart, right? Some girls get it. So if they get it, they should feel special and they should go uh, with that thing, which comes Mm -hmm. in their heart. Alhamdulillah. So, um, sister, you mentioned that you, you've got like kind of four professions almost here. You said you mentioned engineering, um, computer science engineering, you're a graphic designer. You, you yeah. also um, teach um, IELTS as well, and you're a HIFS teacher. So when I um, saw your Instagram profile, it was the HIFS that attracted me because, mashallah, it was giving really beneficial tips. So can you just give us some um, insight? How did you get involved with HIFS? Like, how, how has your kind of career path gone from? Because these are quite different subjects, all of them. So can you just give people, the listeners like some kind of insight on how, how you've kind of gone about these different things? How did you come across um, being interested and in taking on these different careers? 
ओके सिस्टर हाँ श्योर दिस इज एक्चुअली इंटरेस्टिंग क्वेश्चन इंजीनियरिंग आई डेड बिकॉज दैट वॉज माई बैचलर दैट वॉज वॉट आई स्टार्टड विद and i had to join in industry but then i got married and i had to come back because engineering i did in india i couldn't right. do it in here okay. right, uh, because here is usually the focus is more for the saudi nationalities and mm-hmm. for expatriates like us we have to go back to our countries to get the higher degrees so i had to come to india and because i got married i couldn't work there mm-hmm. and then i came back again to saudi arabia and here i was searching for job and i got the job initially some jobs i got uh, of teaching obviously because i'm i have been interested in teaching even when i was doing engineering i had this thing in mind that i should get into lecturing these kind of things so what kind of subjects did you want to be teaching it relating to engineering okay. um uh, because computer science and it is really wanted most yeah. one of the most wanted subjects so i thought i would get into that and alhamdulillah sta- i started here and then when i was doing it i found about graphic design and that really interested me so then i did some diploma courses in uh, graphic design and and also to started practicing it because it's more of a practical nature yeah. i thought that i would give it a try and alhamdulillah that was uh, i felt too much interested in it and then i got related i got jobs in that also even for graphic design i'm talking about the teaching jobs i was not working in industry Ooh. but i did some uh, client projects like freelancing and i also used to teach so i was teaching both it and graphic design as a lecturer here in saudi arabia uh, for ielts because the institute that i was teaching is a uk institute so they want ielts academic scores so when i was doing those uh, when i had to give those exams my band would always be very high like 8 8.5 okay. and i would get full bands in the reading and listening section that's when i got interested in ielts and i thought that okay fine this is something and most of the students who sorry most of the teachers who were with me in the institute they were also english uh, lecturers but mm-hmm. still even they couldn't get those scores and they used to tell me that this is not really easy for everyone to get 8 or 8.5 then i realized that okay this is something that allah has blessed in, uh, blessed with me so i should go in this also and then i did some more courses in ielts like for the training purposes i did tefl i did ielts certification and all of that mm-hmm. and then i started teaching ielts and alhamdulillah uh even for that many of my students who got trained through me they have seen huge uh you know improvement in their marks and all of that actually i provide ielts to two types uh free ielts is provided in my youtube channel i maybe yeah. we can link that in the description in your description definitely definitely and uh and the free, uh, paid ielts is when they get a personal coaching with me and i give them like one to one and it's life coaching so i provided those things then what happened was hips how i got into hips is that um i actually wanted to learn tajweed it was my annual vacation once and i thought that okay fine i have been doing all these kind of uh, you know earning things i have been learning so many things for this world and I, alhamdulillah i was earning well but it uh, it made me realize that okay i have been spending all these months in earning what about my mm, sorry akhira Mm-hmm. Of, for the day of judgment right yeah, yeah. and then it in, uh, in uh, hit me that okay fine i have not been preparing much for my day of judgment i need to do something uh, alhamdulillah i was doing the salah uh, quran fast all those things were fine so i wanted to do something extra and then i realized that i have to do hifd for doing hifd i had to learn tajweed you see how it all yeah, came so all you know, connected course, yeah. Yeah, and then I fi- finally thought that okay, I will start doing the hip. So I started. I, I'm not doing. I'm doing it by myself, uh, and I have a teacher to whom I recite. She corrects me on all of that, and even that happens online because now alhamdulillah everything is online. So that is how it uh, has started interesting me because I realized that I want to do something to make my uh, level rise in Jannah. I want to get the highest place in Jannah. So I was searching. I was actually researching like how to get in the highest place of Jannah. What can I do? And this this was obviously there was like sadqa and all those things, and then this thing popped up. that if we memorize quran if quran is in our heart then that will rise our status in mm-hmm. jannah and also it will intercede for us in the day of judgment then i wanted to like okay i need to do this <laughs> and this is how it started alhamdulillah mashallah tabarakallah so could you um give the listeners some tips and things like that because you do share a lot of kind of tips for hifz on your um instagram and are you are you teaching in, um the hifz 
online as well you said yeah no i'm teaching tajweed because i did okay. not complete hip till now so okay. i'm not really qualified to teach hip but because tajweed i already completed the course and yeah. i'm well aware also when i was teaching tajweed i realized that many most of the people are not following the tajweed although it is given clearly in islam it's, it's clearly in, instructed that we need to learn tajweed and recite the quran with tajweed but most of us who are non arabs obviously we don't know tajweed and people just ignore the part that why are people ignoring things because learning tajweed is not that hard when i did not learn it i felt that maybe it's going to be something uh, more of a confusion or something but when i started learning it i felt that okay this is pretty easy and i thought okay i can teach this alhamdulillah by that time i had some uh, a good community in instagram they were a lot interested in tajweed and i realized fine so if you are interested then we can start and alhamdulillah that is how uh, teaching tajweed has started Allahumma barik sister. Mashallah, that's really good. So, can you um give us some tips then for um yeah. memorization? Yes, as you right. said, you're memorizing yourself now. Yes, yes. Uh, hip tips is first of all. Initially, when I started, I started with listening to Sheikh Mushari Al Fasi. I would just play his audio in the background because I'm not a good memorizer. Even in my school and college days, I could not memorize something. Even the basic definitions, I couldn't learn it. i would write it in my own words so memorizing something is very difficult for me so what i do is i put it in the background and then i open the quran and i read those lines maybe i take three lines or four lines and i keep reading it with the audio and then what i i do it for approximately 10 times and then what i do is i keep the quran i don't keep it open and then i close my eyes and i keep listening to the audio or maybe if i have some work i'll be doing the work but i would be consciously listening to the audio i wouldn't be ignoring it because we are not allowed to ignore the quran right we have to respect it that's why i would be listening to the quran continuously and then as i keep listening over and over again maybe 50 times maybe more than that then it starts fitting in my head and then again i take the quran and i read along with the audio this is something that works for me but there are several other techniques actually um so for those who cannot memorize who are oral le- learners who can learn through audios this is a good tip but for those who can read and learn i would say that read it 10 times close eyes and then recite it by yourself then open your eyes read it again close and recite this is one of the technique that works for most of the uh, people who are trying to do hip mashallah mashallah i haven't tried the writing you know um personally but um I saw you was um for example surah ar-rahman that's one of the ones that really um stood out to me on your instagram post, um profile because I alhamdulillah I memorized it but then I found that in there's like two or three particular ayah where um I sometimes get like I forget the order that they come in because obviously there's so much repetition in it so you know after all you can kind of lose your place but um yeah this is the this is the tip that I've picked up from you which I've started following now because I'm trying to obviously um you know do revision and things mashallah so I, f- I thought that was really nice and if you can t- explain to the um the listeners like what that tip is basically uh subhanallah sister i'm glad you found it useful because the reason i put those things in order is because i face the same issue that you are talking about uh even although i memorize and i could say all the verses but i couldn't say it in the proper order mm. so what i do is i write the starting words of all the ayahs i don't do it for all the surahs because some of the surahs once we learn it we know the order because yeah. most of the ayahs are not repeated but for mm-hmm. those are surahs which are very difficult or very confusing just take the first words of the uh for of each of the ayahs and list it down and what we should do is when we are listening to the ayah in the from the phone we should also go through those things that we have written on the note and when we go through it step by step what happens is the whole picture of the note gets stuck in our head and then when we are reading it it keeps coming uh, automatically you know it keeps coming in our mind and we can recite it in that manner alhamdulillah mashallah mashallah Yeah, I think I think that's a really good idea because it's really helping me actually. So alhamdulillah, and I'm and that for um, uh, as well um, the following surah 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 al waqi as well. Even though there's not really so much of repetition in there, but I find that there's yeah there's a particular place where I get a little bit confused too. So that's what I've been um yeah I'm implementing that for that surah as well. Mashallah. So I think this is um, this is quite beneficial um. 
as you said, for solos where there's quite a bit of repetition. So alhamdulillah, if inshallah people can also pick that up too. Mashallah, yes, yes, sister. inshallah, sister, subhanallah. Alhamdulillah. So sister, um, um, what advice would you give to um, any sister, for example, um, who would like to wear the niqab, but they don't feel confident to wear it? Because even in Saudi Arabia now, I know that um, from what other sisters have been telling me, there's, um, you know, it's becoming more common that girls are not wearing the niqab anymore. They don't want to wear the niqab. So what would you, what kind of advice would you give to those girls who maybe they don't want to wear the niqab because for them it's something just cultural? Yes. And on the other side, for some for other sisters, for example, who they, they want to wear it, but they feel that you know they don't have the confidence to do so what advice would you give to these two different sisters okay for sisters who are willing to wear it and they don't have confidence alhamdulillah their path is a bit easier than the sisters who don't really have an idea of wearing it at all mm -hmm. for the sisters who are interested in wearing alhamdulillah allah is guiding them and they should follow what allah is saying them uh, regarding their confidence i think it will be it will increase when they join such those communities because in every city uh, in all the countries there are islamic ladies islamic centers where ladies come together they have some quizzes they do have they should go in those places and join in those kind of communities because when they be with those sisters who are wearing niqab they will also feel encouraged and they can ask for suggestions from them according to the culture that they are living in because if they are hanging out only with friends who don't wear niqab then obviously they will f find it difficult to follow something that their surroundings are not following so this is one of the things that because even for me if i feel that i need some kind of help or maybe i'm not um, you know I, I want some suggestions in something then i try to find our sisters who are good in those things and then i try to connect with them either here through the ladies center or through online if i see if i'm inspired from someone i get to them and i see and i ask them the tips so the sisters who are interested in wearing they should find their own communities not to leave the other friends obviously they should have connection with everyone but at, at least include those kind of communities in their life so that they meet them at least once a week or once a month where they can get together and talk about niqab and how it, they are improving in those things so that can help and obviously do asking allah for help is the best thing for the sisters who have lost in the touch in niqab yes uh, it has happened in saudi arabia unfortunately um, many uh, i see many girls who just hang out even their abaya are not proper unfortunately it's all open from the uh, top to bottom the buttons it's all unbuttoned the mm -hmm. abaya also mm -hmm. unfortunately it's happening over here i think that's because of i would say that's also a part of the parenting because when girls go outside here they go with their parents sometimes they go mm -hmm. with their friends but it's not that open that they can hang out completely free like the way they hang out in western countries so parenting also has an impact um besides that the culture here because the way they are promoting the culture here is that um you know for the women for the women to have freedom they should you know remove niqab remove abaya that's kind of unfortunately the culture that is uh, progressing over here mm. so i don't really know why they are doing it because alhamdulillah this was a, such a blessed country but currently the situation for them uh, even for the um, the organizations before there were so many people who would uh, uh, you know um, put out the statement that you should follow hijab follow niqab but those statements are not being seen anywhere here because mm. they want to be westernized removing niqab doesn't give freedom we can be bold we can achieve a lot of things in life wearing niqab so when they when the girls understand this that freedom is not equal to removing niqab that's one maybe um that's when maybe they will get back to wearing niqab and abaya and all of that so correcting their perception correcting their thoughts will really help in these kind of things inshallah inshallah i think that's inshallah. very um very good um advice alhamdulillah yeah because i think as well like part of the issue is you know is, is is connecting with your religion i mean even if a sister doesn't feel like she wants to wear the niqab but even dressing in proper hijab generally you know with you mentioned yeah. the abaya and these things like even that is like becoming you know very relaxed now 
So um, yeah. it's, it's about it's about Islam when we when we know that we're doing um, you know wearing our hijab for the sake of Allah, wearing the hijab for the sake of Allah. This makes it something um, you know you have a stronger bond with it. It's not just something that you see as cultural. So this is important. Yeah, yeah. alhamdulillah. Yes, I think, I mean, I think, yeah, yeah, that is also a very good point issue, actually. Because yeah. obviously every Muslim country has their kind of um, style of dress, isn't it? So yes. maybe in Saudi Arabia, I think this is one of the things like the naqab is just being, you know, the naqab and abaya has just been something which is for the women, they just see it as part of their style. Because I remember um, I met some sisters here from Saudi Arabia and when I was, because I studied um, the, you know, the English teaching as well. And when I was, when, when I was in the, um, in the um, course that I was doing, subhanAllah, the sisters, um, the sisters, they were saying to me that, oh, they like it, that I'm wearing the carbon things and how it's nice. And they were saying that they didn't like England because um, women, because of the way that women dress and they prefer Saudi Arabia because people, uh, the women have to wear abaya, but even these sisters, I was wearing an abaya and my naqab, but they wasn't. They were wearing jeans and jumper with a scarf, you know. So they had. They obviously tied the perception of um, covering, um, you know, with proper hijab to their culture and not to Islam. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I thought that was like I found that strange. I do, I do have friends from Saudi Arabia as well who, mashallah, they always wear proper like abaya and hijab and everything wherever they are. It's not. You know, they don't just wear it when they're in their country. They wear it even when they leave. So I think it's partly down to how people practice, how people understand the religion of Islam as well. So this is really, really important. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, Understanding the religion of Islam, that this is a requirement in Islam and you have to do it to make Allah happy. And also that this is not equal to freedom. Because I think most of the girls here, young girls, I'm not uh, very well aware of the older women here, uh, but the young girls, because I see my students and all of that, so I can understand they equate removing niqab to freedom, which is not actually the case. So that would also help them, maybe. Alhamdulillah. Sister, to end of the in- interview, what does the niqab yes. mean to you? For me, I have been wearing this for so long, alhamdulillah, that I'm now very comfortable with this. I cannot imagine my life or going outside without wearing niqab this one is like a safe haven for me i feel safe i feel protected i feel um, empowered i feel that uh, for muslims alhamdulillah i feel closer to allah when i wear it i feel that i'm doing this for the sake of allah and i also uh, feel secured the the sense of securement that i feel in my heart is something uh, i cannot describe Yes, alhamdulillah, I'm doing it for the sake of Allah. But at the same time, it gives me a sense of satisfaction, a sense of safety and security. So these things are very important for me when I'm going outside. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair, sister. Thank you so much for giving your time today for um, this interview. I really, really appreciate it. Wa alaikum, sister. It was really nice talking to you and expressing myself. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, sister.